finally, and finally, let us then focus on the last major ism of this part of class, and that is constructivism. Constructivism is, first thing I want to say, constructivism may not even be a theory. Constructivism may actually be better understood as a downloadable mod for an existing theory, to make the theory better. Okay? Constructivism is really an enhancer to a vanilla version. Okay? With this understanding, constructivism offers an account really of the politics of identity. We're going to think, how does that work in IR? The politics of identity. Constructivism, like liberalism, runs on ideology. But more than just that, it takes the notion of ideology and applies the way in which states perceive other states to be, based on criteria of nationalism, ethnicity, race, gender, and religion. All of them are involved in global politics. Liberalism just simply says ideology exists, which usually doesn't go beyond the philosophical. Constructivism says ideology takes the form of these more identifiable variables and explains not only how states interact with each other, but why. Explains why states interact with the states that they do. Because it is in constructivism that we begin to understand how states will see someone else as, in quotes, deliberately, an ally, an enemy, a neutral country. It doesn't have to be diplomatically neutral. It could just be neutral based on our own goals and interests. A peaceful country, a belligerent country, an aggressive country, a terrorist country, a communist country, fascist, democratic, you name it, and all of them are deliberately put in quotes. Because if you look at the way US foreign policy works, and I, you know, I constantly use the United States because it's probably most familiar to all of you, it's fair enough to say, why does the United States treat Cuba differently than China? Both countries are communist, but yet we're somehow punishing Cuba for being communist, and that doesn't really get in the way of our bromance with China. And why? Because we don't see China as communist. We see China as, well, economically advantageous. Cuba, well, here's the thing. We never really had a war with China that we lost. We're still kind of itching and really angry over that Bay of Pigs thing. And it's bad enough that we got a commie country about 90 miles off the coast of Florida, led by somebody who's been around for 75,000 years. Okay. We look at Cuba today, and some people say, don't do business with communists. To which I would say, we have no problem working with the Chinese, or the Vietnamese, for that matter. Okay. Some countries get a completely green light, as far as we're concerned. Great Britain, an ally. As a matter of fact, look, let's, let's acknowledge one of the worst kept secrets in US foreign policy. There are two countries. Two countries that the United States gives carte blanche to. There are two countries that must and always be allies of the United States. If you lose these, you've done something instrumentally wrong. What are those two countries? Uh, wait. Uh, Great Britain and uh, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia? We've got an even bigger country that's more important. We will throw Saudi Arabia under the bus <coughs> if this country oh, is viable. All together now. Israel. 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 Okay? Saudi Arabia is pretty much up there. But if we have to choose, hey, Saudi Arabia is kind of harassing Israel. Hey, buddy, what are you doing? Get away from them. Okay? If Iran's harassing Saudi Arabia, hey, what are you doing? Get away from them. You know? Great Britain and Israel. Two countries that can do no wrong. Any other country we can be allies with, but at some point there's a price. And we will abandon them. It's just, it's just how it is. Okay? Do we look at Canada as an ally? Yes. Do we look at Canada as a strategic ally? Kind of look at it as our sort of friendly Ned Flanders neighbor to the north. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's about it. Why not just call it America's hat? America's hat. 
you know, America's hat. You know, how do the Canucks view us as an American? Who cares? Right? Is Mexico a democracy? I'll give it a B minus C plus. You know? But do we view Mexico in the same way that we, that we view Canada? Is there a wall along the American Canadian border? No. Do we want a wall on the US Mexican border? Oh, we want something they'll be able to see from space. Okay. How is it that we can look at, let's say, Russia as belligerent? And yet, we find no problem with Saudi Arabia as a country that promotes peace. Does it make sense? From a certain point of view. How about this one? How many countries in the world view the United States as peaceful? And how many countries view the United States as aggressive or belligerent? The second half, more than the first. To which we're like, what the hell, man, America don't do anything wrong with that. It's like, hey, you know, perceptions. That's what constructivism is based on, perceptions. Perceptions, perceptions, perceptions. Perceptions, ladies and gentlemen, form foreign policy. Perceptions form the way in which we engage with states. Realism says a state is a state is a state is a state. Constructivism says a state is a state, but it has adjectives. It has an identity. If we wake up tomorrow morning and we read in the newspaper that Great Britain just decided to build 10 more atomic bombs, are we really going to be upset about that? Great Britain, jolly good. If we wake up tomorrow and we find that Iran has 10 atomic bombs, are we going to take the same cavalier approach? Probably not. Okay, probably not. State is a state is a state? I don't think so. Okay? With this in mind, constructivism points to the merits of identification. Identification in politics. And the way in which states make the choices that they do. 1990, Gulf War I, you know, the good one. Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait and thinks that he is going to get the backing of almost every other Arab country in the Middle East. Because as far as he's concerned, he is basically spreading Iraqi hegemony against Western American hegemony. Right? If there's going to be anybody controlling the Middle East, might as well be an Arab country. The Saudis are going to fall into line. The Jordanians are going to fall into line. The Lebanese are going to fall into line. Oh, what a grotesque error that guy made. He thought that the Arab world would rise up and back him against the West. Whereas the United States, on the other hand, says, yeah, that's funny. Um, Iraq is belligerent, and we're going to basically isolate a belligerent country and free an occupied country. Works great. Works absolutely great. Foreign policy of Bush the Elder was classic case. Country A invades country B. Hey, I understand that. Germany invades Poland. Look at that. All right, this case, we're actually liberating Poland before Saddam invades Saudi Arabia, which is kind of like France or whatever it happens to be. The way in which perceptions are made helps us also bridge domestic politics into IR studies. How many of you watched what the Republicans referred to as that debate a couple of weeks ago? Okay? And what was in, you know, if you heard, I mean, what was probably the most evil country out there as far as that debate was concerned? Iran. Iran, 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 right? The Ayatollah was basically worse than the devil himself, okay? Some of the candidates were even going so far as to say that the defense of Israel was just as important, if not even more important, to the defense of the United States, always coming from Iran, right? Iran is the evil guy which has effectively been a pain in America's underside since 1979, right? You can't really put a positive spin on Iran as far as U.S. foreign policy is concerned, okay? At the same time, Saudi Arabia gets a free pass. 
We don't really care about them. And Israel can do no wrong. Now, is that a correct assessment of what's going on? No. But is that the assessment that's used? Yes. That's what makes constructivism so useful. Because you kind of scratch your head and think, why are we doing this? This don't make no sense. But at the same time, constructivism will tell us why that rationale is used. <coughs> constructivism considers historical subjectivity far more than either liberalism or realism, which just simply says all states are states. As far as realism, any state, Great Britain, Israel, Iran, North Korea, Canada, they're all potential threats to the United States. Constructivism, on the other hand, allows us to understand. Here's where, it comes, here's where it gets the best part. Constructivism allows states to be a number of things at the same time. Constructivism then leads us to conclude that a country like the United States could be realist towards Iran, liberalist towards Great Britain, commercially Pacific towards Canada, democratic peace theory towards Germany. What constructivism does is it basically says that you can be a number of things at the same time depending upon the state that you're interacting with. And the other thing that constructivism effectively hints at is that there is a gradual evolution of international relations that a state will take with another state, depending upon the level of cooperation and trust. A deeply cooperative state is going to promote strategies of liberalism. When in doubt, when you are in question of what's happening, realism is the default setting. When in doubt, you default to realism. If you can trust your neighbor, if you can work with your neighbor, building up that level of progress yields liberalism. So what constructivism also does is that it dispels the idea that states can be completely naive in believing liberalism works all the time. That never happens. You could totally believe in the principles of Wilsonian liberalism when you're talking to people from Luxembourg, Norway, and Iceland. And you can totally be in the realm of security dilemma when you're talking about North Korea, Russia, and Cuba. And not blink an eye. Okay? What about anarchy? Constructivists also have a rather nuanced approach to anarchy. Anarchy, as far as the constructivists are concerned, don't exist. Anarchy does not exist. Anarchy is an imagined community. It's rather existential, but anarchy is what we make it out to be. It is not a given. The realist will say anarchy is not chaos, it's just simply uncertainty. Liberalists will say anarchy is just the absence of cooperation. Constructivists say anarchy is whatever you want it to be. You want it to be unpredictable? It's going to be unpredictable. <coughs> America, you want to have a belligerent relationship with Iran? Go ahead, have one. It's yours to make. Constructivists will also point out the almost 180 change in U.S.-Chinese relations in the 1970s. In the 50s and 60s, we didn't really talk to the Chinese. As a matter of fact, up until the 1970s, we were trying to convince ourselves that the real China was a small little island in the East Chinese Sea called Taiwan. And mainland China just didn't exist. Take my head in the sense they're going to go away. Until Nixon finally comes up to the idea of saying, you know what, that's dumb. Let's talk to these people. Let's open up maybe some trade relations. And you know what, Nixon gets a bad rap in US history just because he's Nixon. But one of the things that we have to give Nixon credit for, if not being you know, the one that did it, was instrumental in creating, is that Nixon's so-called secret trip to China, where he sits down with Mao. We don't really know what was said, but we do know that in a few short years, not only did Mao die, but the Chinese leadership was much more receptive 
to market capitalism and transnational global trade to the point where today China is too important for the United States to piss off. The Chinese economy goes, well, you all saw what happened to the stock market in the last week of August, right? Those of you that were paying attention to MSNBC at one point saw that the stock market fell by almost a thousand points. And why? Because the Chinese economy was finally hiccuping. And we felt it here. And yet, and yet, today, U.S.-Chinese relationship, we're not, we don't have a bromance like we have with Great Britain. But we do have a strategic alliance. We do have a strategic relationship. China is too important to ignore. Cuba could be ignored, at least up until recently. Russia increasingly cannot be ignored. And the reason why, let's go back then to what we're talking about with Syria. The reason why Russia's actions in Syria are seen as belligerent and not as stabilizing is simple. Russia is backing a horse that we didn't put money behind. Very simple. Russia is backing the Assad regime, and we already said we want him out. We're supporting a ragtag group of moderates that are, you know, sure, I'll take your money. Thanks, America. Okay? We saw that with Afghanistan. Didn't work well. We saw that with Iraq. Didn't work well. So anarchy is what states make of it. Democratic peace theory, no problem. That could work. Why? Because we believe that it can work. Alliances are long-standing. Sure. Why? Because of long-standing friendships. I mean, come on. Who wants to be the president that ruins the relationship with Great Britain? That's for better guess. Not even. Who wants to be the president that pisses off Canada? You know? And has them get the moral <laughs> leverage in the arguments. Dude, come on. Okay? Information clearly shapes state activity. The way in which you see your <laughs> counterpart will be the way in which you deal with them, friendly or unfriendly. So constructivism does validate a lot of liberal principles. That much is certain. Constructivism <laughs> does validate liberal principles. But it also modifies a lot of things, too. This is equally important. Probably one of the biggest things that it modifies is balance of power. According to realist doctrine, balance of power, again, argues that states will balance against any hegemon in the region. It's a natural inclination. Constructivists tweak it with one word. And they don't necessarily adhere to balance of power. They say balance of threats. States do not automatically balance against the hegemon. States balance against the threatening hegemon. If balance of power actually worked, all of Europe and the Soviet Union would have allied against the United States in the Cold War. And they still wouldn't have been able to balance out US power. Instead, the United States and Western Europe allies against the Soviet Union. That's seen as the aggressor. That's seen as the belligerent power. Security dilemmas are also a part of this. Security dilemmas only exist in the presence of a clear threat. According to orthodox realist thinking, any state that increases its capability of power and security will be met with a response by your state. But if we wake up tomorrow and we find that the British, uh, I think we heard something, I was about the British or the French, whatever it is, there's this brand new submarine or this brand new naval, thing. it's got to be the Brits, they're the big naval power, right? British is up, you know, Brits are unveiling this brand new, I don't know, nuclear submarine or whatever it is. And we're like, oh, that's cute. Looks like something from a Bond movie. Awesome. But if we were to find out that this was Iranian, Chinese, North Korean, Russian, we wouldn't be so happy. Security dilemmas only happen in the presence of a threatening country. That's the reason why we don't care what Great Britain's doing. We care what Iran is even thinking of doing. Britain can increase its nuclear arsenal by twice tomorrow. We don't care. Iran thinks of finally you know, testing one bomb, and we're suddenly on the way to World War III. Carly Fiorina will promise you that. <clears throat> And look, the balance of threats does have much more salience. 
It's North Korea that sees the United States, not China, as the threats. Right now, technically, the biggest threat to North Korean sovereignty <coughs> is China. If China wanted to, they could invade and conquer that annoying little country in 48 hours. And they probably have a contingency plan if and when the Kim regime finally collapses. Technically, China is a bigger threat to North Korea than the United States. They are right there. North Korea sees the United States all the way over there as the bigger threat, and China as big brother. As I mentioned in the previous slide, West Germany would have allied with the Soviet Union over the United States. Why? America had the bigger firepower. Easily, easily bigger firepower. Easily bigger military. And yet, West Germany flocks to the United States, along with most of other Western Europe, including the French, who couldn't stand it, but they did. Okay? That also explains why a Pacific Union may be formed. Because like-minded states will band together. Like-minded states will work together like that. Okay? It also helps us explain why the United States' diplomacy is rather selective. You know, we give a damn about human rights violations in the Balkans and in Iraq, but we really don't care about human rights violations in Saudi Arabia or China or other countries that we consider to be pro-American. See, I asked you this question on Monday. Which, which type of regime do you think the United States is going to support more? A pro-democratic regime or a pro-American regime? Nine times out of ten, if you know your Cold War history, pro-American trumps pro-democracy almost all the time. If the pro-American regime is pro-democratic, great, bonus points. But nine times out of ten, if you have to choose, you're going to go with pro-American, not pro-democratic. Case in point, most of Central and South America during the Cold War period. Case in point, Iran in the 1950s where a democratically elected government was overthrown by a CIA-orchestrated coup, which put the Shah back in power from the, mid, from the end of the 50s all the way to the end of the 70s. Okay? It's also the reason why the United States has a much more contentious relationship with Cuba because of its communist underpinnings, God's <coughs> sake, whatever, regardless of other countries. China itself is communist, we don't care. And there's lots of kleptocratic little tin pop dictatorships around the world in the United States. And again, I'm just using the United States. You can use Russia. You can use England. You can use Italy. You can use France. Prior to Gaddafi being seen as a nutcase, Western Europe, for a very brief period of time, liked this guy. Okay? So what constructivism then does, well, is it functions, as I said, more as a modifier. More is a mod than an actual theory. If anything, foreign policy is determined by one state's perception towards the other. Foreign policy is determined by perception. America applies democratic peace theory towards Canada and a security dilemma towards Russia. The United States engages in a balance of power with Saudi Arabia because of the pro-American regime in Riyadh and a balance of threats against Iran. Some people would say foreign policy is hypocritical. Constructivists would say, well, that's just foreign policy. And the final thing that we can look at here, this is something that many of you have been hinting at online. And that is constructivism can allow for the hybridization of realism and liberalism at the same time. That is where we come up with what is probably the most belligerent and dangerous foreign policy, Wilsonian realism. Wilsonian realism is probably the most belligerent. Because if you apply Wilsonian realism to the world, you don't look at country as country A, country B, country C. No. You look at that as a country that needs freedom, a country that needs liberation, a country that needs bombing, a country that needs regime change. Okay? Country over there? Eh. What's that country? Uh, Upper Volta? Is that even on the map? What the fuck is Upper Volta? Okay. 
oh, well, who cares about that? It's in Africa. We don't care. Okay? Well, Sony and realism, which is basically what the neoconservative strategy for regime change in the Middle East was about 10 years ago, okay? which operates under very strong liberalist purposes. Spread the gospel of democracy in the name of human rights, political rights, civil liberties, get rid of tyranny, blah, 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 yeah, America, fuck yeah, Team America, World Police, right? Okay, cool. However, it's selectively chosen in regions of the world that are of strategic interest <laughs> to not only the United States, but other countries as well. That's the reason why we get ourselves involved in the Balkans or the Middle East, less involved in Africa. That's one of the reasons why we were so <coughs> adamant about going into Syria about two years ago, by right, trying to sell the argument that Assad is using chemical weapons against his own people. John Kerry was practically just totally getting himself all hot for this thing at the UN. <laughs> okay? It was ridiculous. The guy was really just getting himself so excited. And the biggest, the biggest buzzkill was Putin coming in and saying, how about you just have the UN go in and look to see if there are chemical weapons and then see how about that, right? Oh, damn it. This is so jonesy for that, okay? Yet why Syria? Why do we care about that, right? Why do we care about Syria? Again, let's kind of go back here. Why? Well, chief of which is it's strategically located in the Middle East. It borders Israel. It borders Lebanon. It borders Turkey. It borders Iraq. America has interest in Iraq. America, I don't need to tell you, this interest in Israel. Lebanon, Turkey, you name it. But let's also be perfectly honest. Syria is also under the radar of both the Russians and the Iranians after the collapse of the Hussein regime in Iraq. A good chunk of Iraq has now fallen under the sway of Iran, which enjoyed immense power in that vacuum. The United States feels that it must get a foothold in Syria if it is to remain relevant. And you know, the word's still out as to what's going to happen in Syria. We don't know. But what is obvious is that over the past week or so, the United States' advantage in Syria has taken a significant step back with the direct involvement of Russia and Iran, and might I also add, one other army that's not part of any country, Hezbollah, which is fighting rather successfully in the regions around the Lebanese border. So why does America want to get itself involved? Do they really care? Do they really care about the people that are dying there? It's a nice excuse, but is it also a gateway to larger self-interest? Okay? It's not the answer, it's not the full answer, but it may give us better insight into how the world works. Okay? And with that, congratulations, we have actually come to the end of part one of this class. How awesome is that? No readings. For next week, if you have done them all now, have a wonderful, wonderful weekend.